Next on BYU Sports Nation, just how and where did it all go wrong for BYU football in Salt Lake City? Eight is definitely not great. Ugh. BYU plays Utah to open the season next year. When will BYU break the streak against that team up north? ESPN's Trevor Maddis on the best thing he saw from BYU amidst the agony and where the Cougars go from here. Plus, has Corbin Kafusi cemented his legendary legacy at BYU? Let's go. This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live, your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Monday, November 26th, wherever and however you're connected, Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with a man who is shopping for more Tupperware on Cyber Monday. His name is Jerem Jordan. Anything to cope with the law. <laughs> oh, man, that was rough. That was rough. BYU has a 20-point lead twice and loses. Oh, BYU discovered a new way to lose to Utah, and it's really disappointing. There were some really nice things in the first half, and then the second half was like the exact opposite. So Brutal. Bummer. Eight in a row, man. That's the thing. BYU throws a pick six, and you think, oh, no, is the time turning? It's coming. Ah, We were all a little scared at halftime, up 20. But then the Cougars score again to go up 27-7, and I thought. I was like, okay, okay. They responded. Weathered that? They responded. And then it was all Utes after that. 28 unanswered. Here is today's show lineup, the regular season finale of Maddich Monday with college football insider Trevor Maddich. He joins us in about 15 minutes. Why he thinks the wheels fell off for BYU. And, Jerem, where are the Cougars going to play next? Bowl game projections. Yay! Cheese! And the legacy of Corbin Kafusi, a loaded Monday show. With that in mind, here are today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. As we just mentioned, BYU falls in another brutal, head-scratching way to Utah. Again, 35-27. BYU led by 20 at halftime. We're outscored 35-7 in the second half. Head coach Kalani Satake, what was on your mind after the game? I think it's supposed to hurt, so you can remember it. And, and luckily we get this game again early next year, so um, we just have to do it for, the, for that time. I mean, it's, uh, it's unfortunate for the seniors. You know, we really wanted this for the players and for our fans, but um, they don't have to wait less than a year, though. BYU now 6-6 six and six on the season and awaiting a bowl invitation. More on those bowl projections later in the show. I know it's less than a year, but it's like nine months of sitting on that. Ugh. Men's hoops lost 76-62 to Houston on Saturday. TJ House scored a season high 25 points, making six threes. BYU inbound. McKay Cannon is checked in. He inbounds to TJ Haas, who pulls up for three. That'll help out. Another three-pointer for T.J. Haas. Disappointing loss as well. That was early in the afternoon. Cougars uh, look to bounce back at Illinois State Wednesday, 8 Eastern time. Hey, here's some good news. BYU women's volleyball received the number four overall seed in the NCAA tournament. That's the equivalent of a one seed in the NCAA men's basketball tournament. The ladies will host the America East champion Stony Brook on Friday. Junior libero Mary Lake is all about that home cooking. I love the Smithfield House, and I love our fans. I mean, it wouldn't have really made a difference if we gone or stayed in our mentality, but just to know that we're going to be able to have our fans here for as long as we can, just a little bit more, that's exciting because playing this Smithfield House is special. And wouldn't you know, with a win, BYU would face the winner of Utah and Denver. Well, well, well. Uh, Stony Brook tweeted out their reaction to who they drew. And it was, I kid you not, it was like they were scared. They were like, ah! Like, we're excited to be in the tournament, but oh my gosh, we have to play BYU. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this is the best. And Fred Warner recorded seven tackles in the 49ers' loss to the Buccaneers. Warner is 17th in tackles in the NFL, fourth among rookies. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. Jerem, I'm still trying to figure out how BYU lost to Utah. And some things are now starting to materialize. And I think we're getting an idea of just when and why 
the wheels fell off. So with that in mind, my friend, now that we have both had the weekend to think about it, I ask you first, where did it all go wrong for BYU on Saturday night? It was on all three sides of the ball. So BYU played a tremendous first half. I am, and, and even into the first part of the second half in the third quarter, I, I was so excited and proud of the way BYU was showing. I mean, here Utah is, ranked 17th in the college football playoff poll, and BYU is up 20 twice. Then BYU is outscored 35-7 in the second half. Okay, a few injuries played into this, obviously. The Kafusi Cousins, Corbin Isaiah, Matt Hadley, Michael Shelton, those were big injuries, okay? Those affected uh, that, and BYU didn't have the depth to kind of hang there. Offensively, BYU became quite conservative, and Utah's halftime adjustments were better. Second half offense for BYU. Zero points, or sorry, seven points, 110 yards, two of nine on third down. Utah scored 35 in the second half on 296 total yards, by the way, for the game. You shouldn't lose the game giving up 296. Second half punts for BYU. 32 yards, 15, that killed BYU, and 38. Utah had better depth and adjustments, and that's uh, what it came down to, despite a 20-point lead twice. BYU found a new way to lose to Utah, and that's really disappointing. Uh, I think we've made that sound like 17 times already in the show. That's how I feel, dude. <laughs> like I, At halftime, I called you. You're at Rice Eccles, and I'm like, dude, BYU's up 20. What's going on? This is great. There was a significant shift a couple of times emotionally on the sidelines. I embedded myself on the BYU sideline during this game to soak in the rivalry atmosphere at Rice-Eccles and just to kind of get a pulse of the team. And it was fascinating. It was really enjoyable. And then it wasn't so enjoyable to watch kind of that panic mode set in for BYU. But there were a couple of major factors. Number one, when BYU on third and nine in the third quarter – up to run Riley Burt because Matt Hadley's out of the game. He's injured and concede that, hey, we're going to punt the ball. We'll, we'll punt. We're going to punt the ball, and then we're going to play defense because our defense has been playing well. It was kind of like, ooh, okay, now we're in hold-on mode, right? And then BYU punts the ball 15 yards, and Utah takes over inside BYU territory. There was a, there was a significant emotional shift on the sideline when those back-to-back plays happened, and I thought, Oh, man, I looked at Daniel Sorensen, who I was standing next to, and I said, okay, watch out right here. This is, this is going to test the maturity of this team right here because they, are, they have given themselves some significant adversity in a very hostile environment. Utah clearly has 100% of the momentum. And so at that point, I thought, oh, this, this could be really bad. We all felt it slipping away. This could be really yeah. bad. Then when you add up all of the injuries, Matt Hadley – Corbin Kafusi got a little bit banged up. Isaiah Kafusi goes out. Michael Shelton was playing a fantastic football game. BYU's depth was exposed against Utah in that same momentum-shifting, hostile environment, and they just didn't know how to respond. And coupled that with conservative play calling, albeit maybe the coaches, there's an element of, well, we don't have the personnel that we had in there before, so we don't feel at liberty to call everything that we want to call. With the like, because Matt Hadley and Riley Bird are totally different players, so it just it, it, the wheels fell off in a hurry. The snowball effect happened in a hurry, and I think it started with injuries, and then that two play shift in the second half. A lot changed quickly, especially in the second half. So, what was the difference in the game? I think I was just going there. Um, not only is Kyle Whittingham a really good coach and his staff really good, I'm sure that they made some adjustments and really all those former Cougars on his staff are really really good. got after the team <laughs> in the locker room. Um, they took advantage of the fact that BYU had to play some really young players in a really tough situation. Utah knows, already was, yeah. Utah knows all about it at Arizona State when Tyler Huntley goes down and Jason Shelley comes in and, in a road atmosphere like they never really recovered. Okay, so. BYU at a couple of key positions, they just didn't have the maturity and the experience to handle that. And I think that's kind of where the difference was turned in the game. Utah has that experience now. They know what it's like to go through. And they they know how to close out a game. BYU is still learning how to do that. Halftime adjustments were a big deal, uh, really big deal. And Utah made them, and BYU didn't make enough, right? Injuries, not enough depth like we've talked about. Zach Wilson was fantastic in this game, by the way. So good. Like, his pick six, that's a bad play, right? But to throw a pick six against Utah is tradition. 
Uh, the last three games, we oh, Julian Blackman's a, a really good player. A total of four pick sixes in the last three games for Utah against BYU. 20 of 29, 204, two touch, 73 rushing yards, including 31 on one play for Zach Wilson. Not having Matt Hadley was a big difference in the game. Not having Isaiah Kafusi in there for a quarter and a half or whatever what was a big difference. Matt Bushman was awesome in this game. It was good to see the freshman All-American look like an All-American type tight end. But BYU ultimately couldn't rush the ball, got a little conservative with the lead. Um, and, and then ultimately, uh, defensively, BYU was on skates. Um, whatever BYU did in the first half, it wasn't working in the second half. And unfortunately, uh, BYU blew it epically in the second half. Think about it. In the history of the rivalry. 20-point lead in the second half. What's the largest that's comeback a, in Utah history that's an against BYU? Epic, epic uh, you know, loss there for BYU. So it, it stinks. There were some positives there, but I'm not counting any more victories today. I'm excited for you know a few of the positive things I saw, but to lose to Utah by one or 44 is not a big difference. And to have a 20-point lead and to lose is really tough. It's really tough. Yeah, that is a way that BYU has not lost against Utah during this current streak. It Found was a new, new way. It was new. In fact, I think at Cougar Stats tweeted out initially that the last time BYU had a 20-point lead in Salt Lake City was 1996, that magical 14-1 season. Yeah, 37-17, one by 20. Yeah, the Cougars two different times, 20 to nothing and 27-7 halfway through the third quarter, led by 20 points. And so not, it was great what BYU doing. It always it was stings. Incredible. It always stings and it always resonates. We've we've downgraded from mad to sad though. This is a new type of sting. Yeah, we're not like ticked off. We're just like, "Oh, it happened again." Oh, great. Jerem, that has <laughs> us all now looking ahead. Because immediately after the game ended, I thought to myself, okay, BYU's got a bowl game, and then they've got to open the season yeah. when, against Utah. When the present stinks, you just look forward. On August 29th <laughs> of 2019. Yay. So, Jerem, when will BYU beat Utah and end the losing streak? Next year. Hit it! Countdown to Utah. 276. 276, people. We're counting down. Like I said, when the present stinks, you just look ahead, okay? When the past and present are inconvenient, just push it forward. So 276 days until the rematch. You better believe your boy Zach Wilson and Lopini Katoa and Gunnar Romney and Dallin Holker and all this young crew, right? I'm looking at the They're offensive line. Let's go. As Ryan Pugh is coaching him up on the sideline, and I'm seeing... Empey, Christensen, Hodge. Longson. Longson. I'm missing someone in there. Well, it's Austin, it's Austin Hoyt. He's, Austin Hoyt's he's the, the only, only senior. senior. Yeah. Everybody else is young. And I thought, wow. BYU had to play its fifth string running back, by the way. Everyone wanted Riley Burt to play. Eight, eight carries, 12 yards. It's hard to run against Utah. But Matt Hadley was running effectively. You just needed to be north of three. He averaged three and a half yards a pop. That was working. And, and the pass game down the field was working. And like I said earlier in the week, Zach Wilson had to make plays with his feet, and he did. He rushed for 73 yards. Did he finish as BYU's leading rusher? Yes. Then, he did. So that was big time, right? He had everything going, and then, ah, just, ah. What's, what's, what's the game of blocks you pull out? When, Jenga. Jenga? Jenga. It was Jenga for BYU. Everything's, like, stacking up. It's all good. And then you pull out a couple blocks, Isaiah Kafusi, Corbin Kafusi, Matt Hadley, Michael Shelton. And it topples. Toppled. Stuff. Yeah, that, that is the unfortunate reality that BYU is dealing with, uh, with injuries and depth. To answer your question, I, when, when I, are they going to win? I feel like BYU will win the game next year. I don't feel like eight years ago has anything to do with next year. I, I think that this BYU group is going to be ready to go in the first home game. There's going to be a ton of juice. You've returned Zach Wilson. You return that offense, hopefully. Let's go. Yes, you've got a whole offseason to now work this new RPO shotgun yes, offense with Zach offense Wilson. entirely in the middle of the year. Utah gets Tyler Huntley back. Yeah, I know, and he's a really good player, but and Zach, Zach Moss? You think Zach Moss is going to the league or something? He, he's he, an NFL, but he's a projected late first round, early second rounder. They lose Chase Hansen. They lose Cody Barton. Like, they lose yeah. some key cogs on a defense that is really good. Like, if BYU Moss is, is a junior, so he could come back, but if he goes pro. BYU yeah. is good enough to hang this year. And BYU's been good enough to hang for a long time. The juice will be high. It's, on it's only when Utah goes to a BCS game or a New Year's Six. 
And and perhaps they will. We'll see. They play Washington Friday. Hashtag go Huskies. Question of the day. <laughs> what was the good, the bad, and the ugly in the BYU rivalry loss? Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. Response in from at Adam Wetton on Twitter. The good. BYU was able to establish a solid lead. Yeah, 20 points. The bad. They blew that solid lead by changing the offense and defensive strategy at half. The ugly. The losing streak against the rivals should have been broken. It should have. That was the game. It was, it was coming down. Chris underscore MC2 on Instagram. The good. Zach Wilson is the real deal. I think he can be really good. That was his best game as a Cougar. Three more years that was his of Zach best Wilson. Game. Yeah. The bad. Not getting just one needed offensive play or defensive stop in the second half. The yeah, ugly. BYU got like one one stop. There were five touchdowns from Utah. Five. The ugly. BYU lost to Utah yet again. Hashtag BYUSN Twitter, Facebook, and or Instagram. Coming up, are going for two picks. Did I take the lead? I'm trying to remember what your picks were. Trevor oh, I know Maddich. the answer. Trevor Maddich is up next. ESPN College Football Insider has that empty feeling again after the latest loss. But does he see hope for the future? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Tomorrow night on BYU TV, break down what happened via the X's and O's against Utah with Dave McCann, Blaine Fowler, Brian Logan, and David Nixon. On After Further Review, it's Tuesday, 7 Eastern on BYU TV and the app. Live from Studio B, this is your day-to-day BYU sports play-by-play. I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. You can always listen to BYUSN on demand by downloading the BYU Sports Nation podcast. Watch the show whenever you want, BYUSN.com, and experience Studio B and the antics in it whenever you want. Our question of the day, what was the good, the bad, and the ugly? In the BYU rivalry loss, at CL underscore living adds this on Twitter. Good. The second half was past my bedtime. Bad. The scoreline Sunday morning. Ugly. The number eight. Yeah. And not being able to do anything about it for another year. At well, least as nine we chronicled, months, right? At least nine months. 276. 276. Yeah. Late August. Let's go. To open the 2019 season. Love Hashtag BYUS and Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline is ESPN college football analyst, insider, all around good man, BYU national champion Trevor Maddich, back for another Maddich Monday. Trevor, I know it was a weird game, weird weekend. Right now, how would you explain the emotions you felt as you watched the BYU Utah game from start to finish? Well, in the beginning, I was elated because they were playing to the highest level of their capability. They were physical. They were flying around. They were confident. Young quarterback Zach Wilson was decisive. He was accurate. I mean, hyper accurate at times. It was, it was a joy to watch. And as they developed that 20-point halftime lead, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, okay, now the weight of their depth is going to tell in the second half what will happen. And at that point, when things started to fall apart a little bit, I uh, started to have this foreboding feeling. It wasn't a a sense of doom, but it was like, uh uh-oh, we need to stay up by three scores. Uh Uh-oh, we need to stay up by two scores. Uh Uh-oh, we need to stay up at all. And that's kind of the way it flowed. And at the end of the game, I just had this, this empty feeling, not for me, but for those players, and especially for Corbin Kafusi because of what he sacrificed to play in that game. Yeah, what an incredible story. And uh, as he was being helped off the field, uh, Corbin, Corbin from the BYU crowd there, which was pretty cool. So the first half, yeah. BYU is up 20 to nothing. Second half, BYU is outscored 35-7. What changed, in your opinion, in the second half? What changed was two things. One was mistakes. We figured that BYU would need to get some mistakes from Utah in order to jump ahead of them, and they did. They... Um, you know, they got the muff punt, the turnover. They got a, a, a shanked punt, which gave them a short field. BYU capitalized, credit them, turning those into touchdowns. And that's one of the things that helped them develop the lead. But then that equalized because BYU had a shank punt, which gave Utah a short field that they scored on. And then there was the pick six. And so all that became equal. So now it comes back to depth and injuries because that's the other thing really is the injuries. One of them was when Matt Hadley got hurt. Uh, that was a big deal in this game 
because I think Utah's defense was worried most about the running of Zach Wilson over any other ball carrier that BYU would have since Katoa and Canada were out heading into the game. So Hadley was doing a nice job between the tackles, I think, in part because Utah was worried about the edges. But when he went out, he was averaging uh, three and a half yards a carry. Uh, Riley Burt, bless his heart, um, averaged 1.5 yards per carry. That was a big difference from a standpoint of first downs. That means BYU offense couldn't stay on the field as much. That means Utah's offense, uh, excuse me, Utah's defense could get off the field more. So that's one of them. The other one was on the other side of the ball, Isaiah Kafusi, BYU linebacker. He was phenomenal all game long at setting the edge, getting upfield and making sure the quarterback couldn't roll out, making sure that the, the wide running game didn't have success and set that hard edge, man. He was, a, he was fantastic. When he went out, all of a sudden, Utah started to target the edge, and I think they, they got enough running going there that they were able to string together some good running plays that they weren't able to do in the first half. Now, again, I don't like to talk numbers in a radio show, but these numbers, I think, tell the tale. In the first half, with Kafusi in there, Utah averaged 3.1 yards per carry. In the second half, they averaged almost five yards a carry. In the first half, Utah got four first downs. In the second half, they got 14 first downs. And what that did was it made BYU's defense stay on the field, and that's where depth started to where where uh, to to show up. So I think it was a combination of returning the mistakes to Utah to equalize that out, and then the injuries. BYU just didn't have an answer. It's the regular season finale of Maddich Monday on BYU Sports Nation. ESPN's Trevor Maddich with us. With BYU losing eight in a row to Utah now, Trevor, where do you see the future of this rivalry game going? I hope it continues, but the cold, hard facts are that it is not in the interest of Utah on the field to keep it going. With nine Pac-12 regular season games every year, it makes more sense for Utah to schedule winnable games in their non-conference. And as BYU continues to grow under Kalani Sataki, this game will get tougher and tougher for Utah. So I, I think it's very important for the fans. It's very important for the people of Utah and for the state. And it's very important to, to BYU. But for Utah... If you take the emotion out of it, it makes no sense to continue it. So I'm hoping that the emotion does play a role in it because I'd love to see this thing keep going. Yeah, BYU and Utah are scheduled for the next four seasons. It's the opening game for both teams in three of those four. So we look forward to that, especially next year. Zach Wilson grew up a Ute, Trevor. He was extremely comfortable in that stadium having rooted for the other team, and now he's the BYU quarterback. What did you think of his performance in his first rivalry game? He was phenomenal. Often in a rivalry game on the road like that, a freshman quarterback will get caught up in the moment and try to prove to everybody how great he is. What Zach Wilson did was run the offense extremely well, and when it came time to improvise and make a play, he did so decisively, and he did so with an uncanny knack to do the right thing most of the time. And I think the positive comments that came from the Utah defense about Zach Wilson after the game were a real testament to how well he performed as a freshman. ESPN's Trevor Maddich with us. Besides Zach Wilson, what was the best thing you saw from BYU on Saturday night? The best thing I saw was heart. I've seen that a lot over the course of this season, and it's exemplified by what Corbin Kafusi did. He had a leg injury that required surgery, and the doctors told him that if he could handle the pain, the injury wouldn't get worse if he played in this game, so he played. Turns out he's going to need three surgeries on three different body parts and he played anyway and he played extremely well i've had to do that uh not in my college career but my nfl career where i had a shoulder injury that was so excruciatingly painful that i couldn't sleep for more than an hour at a time at night it was it was just horribly painful but the doctors told me that it wouldn't get worse and so i continued to play and so i understand what he went through and to me it's not just about Corbin. It's not just about the contribution he made. It's his teammates seeing his investment in them. And that's a culture building moment. And so I think Corbin Kafusi leaves BYU not just with having given them great performance on the field and a great leader off the field, but he gave them an example in his last game that will ratchet up the investment of every player on that team. Yeah, it was inspirational. I, I loved it. It was fantastic. Uh, the regular season's over for BYU, Trevor. Six and six. How would you evaluate how BYU did in the regular season in 2018? Well, 
if you look at it from 30,000 feet, the goal this year was to make a bowl game. And with the schedule of having to play Washington, Arizona, Cal, Utah, Wisconsin, Utah State, Boise State, it looked like it was going to be a, a really strong feat in order to get there. And they did. They got there. And they almost pulled off the rivalry win against Utah. So when you look at what they wanted to get done, they accomplished it. Now they've got the two weeks of practice. Now they've got the bowl. Now, it's not what they wanted necessarily, especially from a fan standpoint. But it's all about trajectory. BYU is on the way up for the right reasons. And the the accomplishment of making a bowl this season is – it happened because of the right reasons, because of toughness, because of execution, and because of an all-in attitude by these players with their coaches. Trevor, let's finish with this. Right now, who do you see in the college football playoff? I see Alabama beating Georgia in the SEC championship game, which, by the way, is no uh, gimme. That's going to be a tough game for Alabama. I think Clemson will be number two. Or number one, they might flip that. But Clemson, Alabama, Notre Dame is in now. They're 12-0. They're and 0. They're in. Now the question is what happens at number four. And if Oklahoma wins, if they beat Texas in the Big 12 championship game, if Ohio State beats Northwestern in the Big 10 championship game, then you'll have both of those teams at 12-1, and one, and the committee will have to decide which one is the better team, probably on tape. Because when you look at the, all the metrics that they use, strength of record, strength of schedule, things like that, you can make a case for either team. They would have chosen Oklahoma easily if Ohio State had beaten Michigan but looked poor in doing it. But they looked dominant in doing it, and that's what changed. Oklahoma went to West Virginia gave up 50-some points, but scored 50-some points and won the game, and that's exactly what the committee expects of them. Ohio State has looked really spotty on tape on both offense and defense, unlike Oklahoma, which only looked bad on defense. But in being so dominant on both sides of the ball against Michigan, if they do it again and look dominant against Northwestern, I think the committee will be able to make the case that Ohio State, at the end of the season, is playing more like a playoff team overall than Oklahoma is, and I would pick the Buckeyes if they do that. Wow. Great stuff, Trevor. We appreciate the time. BYU, looking forward to uh, a bowl game invitation. I'm sure we'll be addressing that with you at some point. We appreciate it, my friend. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, guys. Trevor Maddich on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, your values, your timeline, your financial future. Is what it is, right? Uh, Saw some good things built for the future. Go get them next year at home. 276 days away. Utah, man. I'm so happy that's the first game. A bowl game and then Utah. Go. Yeah, the uh, off season will be lit. It always <laughs> is because we have to make it that way. We do a daily show. Let's go. Coming up, Corbin Kafusi played Saturday despite multiple season-ending injuries. We'll play his full interview after the game with Spencer. Yeah, that was an emotional interview for him and for me, honestly speaking. Yeah, that was uh, a great one, so don't miss it if you did. And next, who finished strong in our going for two predictions and who didn't? This is BYU Sports Nation. Was it me? Was it him? Who was it? Who was it? Check out BYU Sports Nation right now with Kiki Solano. She's got the latest deets in Cougar Sports with the social media twist. Watch it on BYU Sports Nation Facebook, IGTV, Twitter, and YouTube accounts. Rolling, rolling, rolling on on BYU Sports Nation with today's BYUSN headlines. The Cougars of BYU football lose again to Utah. Wait, again since Saturday? (laughs) Or just once? Just once. Oh, okay. But eight times. I was like, they played again? 35 27. BYU had a 20 point halftime lead, outscored 35 7 in the second half. They're now 6 6 on the season and awaiting a bowl invitation. We'll tell you some of those projections coming up. Men's Hoops falls to Houston, 76-62 on Saturday. T.J. Haas scored a season-high 25 points, made uh, six three-pointers. Cougars play at Illinois State Wednesday at 8 Eastern. And remember how the RPI died? There's this new metric called NET, and the NCAA just released. Everybody's ranking. BYU's 94th in it. Gonzaga's 5. LMU is 10. San Francisco's 25. For those that don't know, does RPI play any factor in that new NET accumulation? I don't think so. Perhaps it does. I, I thought that it was, they got rid of it. So they combine like 
like Ken Palm and Sagarin and like all these. New, you have to rank everybody to put them in quad somehow. This is how they rank people. Previously, it was RP. It's better. Can we, uh, we hope, all agree on hold that? On, hold on. We hope it is because LMU is at 10. So <laughs> what? Uh, it's a meritocracy to the utmost San degree. San Francisco's 25. To the so utmost degree. It's November 26th in college. It's very, it's very early, clearly. <laughs> BYU women's volleyball has a resume worthy of the number four overall seed in the NCAA volleyball tournament. They'll host America East champion Stony Brook on Friday with a win. BYU takes on either Utah or or Denver in the second round. Mm, love it. That was that was a sold out, most attended game of BYU women's volleyball history earlier this year. Yeah. So versus Utah. A, a few years ago, BYU had a similar scenario where they were hosting the first two rounds, and Utah was here. UNLV upset Utah, so BYU and Utah never never happened. happened. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. I I want Utah to win the game because I want to see BYU Utah Saturday. So much fun. That'd be awesome. And Fred Warner records seven tackles in the 49ers' loss to the Buccaneers. Warner's now 17th in the NFL in tackles, fourth among rookies. BYU football has played 12 regular season games, six wins, six losses. Jeremy and I have made two predictions for each of those 12 games. We call it going for two, and it's time to revisit what we did. Can you predict the future? These guys think they can. We're going for two on BYU Sports Nation. Each pick worth one point. Going into the Utah game, Jerem had a nice roll going. He had made four straight correct predictions. It was 11 to 9.5 in the point standing. Jerem, let's recap. Okay, number one, I said neither team will score 24 plus. Yeah. It's a high scoring game. 35 27. Number two, Matt Gay, Utah's kicker, will make three field goals. He was second in the country, making two a game. He attempted one. It wasn't any good. You ready for a stat that doesn't matter that matters? (laughs) BYU opponents, 6 of 18 this year against BYU. That is number one in the country for field goal defense. BYU is the best team against field goals in the country. Kairos Tonga. That doesn't matter, but it matters. Was the reason Matt Gay's field goal got blocked. So I missed both. So I've lost the regular season. Perhaps the season. What well, happened with you? It's okay because uh, it? there's a second half to play in this going for two, right, we'll right. do We'll do men's hoops. But, yeah. but regarding football, did you get yours? Let's hear it. All right. Number one, I said BYU will have more pass yards than Utah. 204. No, it's, it's over. I've lost the regular season. 204 <laughs> for BYU. Utah with Gone. only 141. Number two, BYU will score 17 plus. It's 17 plus in the first half. I was shocked. Utah was giving up 18 and a half points a game, and BYU scored 20 in the first half. And BYU what? had scored 17.3 points per game in the previous seven contests against Utah on average. I, I think I also said, we'd go back to the tape, that BYU would uh, blow a 20 point lead. Do I get that one? No, I didn't predict that. You're right. Oh. There you go. Updated standings. What if I... one of us had said BYU will lead by 20? <laughs> <laughs> that's a Brian Twice. Logan bold prediction. Yeah, that's just, he said BYU have no turnovers. They had one. Oh. Yeah. Uh. Uh. So and you win the regular season. You're up 13 to nine and a half. Yep. So no conti- matter what happens continue in the through basketball. Game, you've won foot. Sorry. You won football. Period. Yeah. So I've so. clinched the football side of the going. For two. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You win. Thank you win. <laughs> but uh, as we all know too well, especially after what happened on uh, Saturday. There are two halves. Yeah. Right? I'm going to start mailing them in. Like, BYU will make a three-pointer. <laughs> so so what's our halves. first game? Illinois State? That's Illinois our first State. game, right? Yes, we will okay. go for so two Let's go. against Illinois State. Okay. Uh, we've done it every week this season on Monday. We look back at everything BYU's football opponents have done. Yes. So let's put a bow yes. on the regular season finale for all of BYU's foes. Starting with Arizona. BYU opened the season with a 28-23 win in Tucson. Arizona finishes the season 5-7. and seven. They blew a 19-point yes. lead against well, their rival. They missed a field goal to win the game. So that that great road win, right? That team finishes 5-7. and seven. Uh, Cal, the Golden Bears beat Colorado 33-21. Forced five turnovers, scored twice on defense. Golden Bears, 7-4. and four. They'll play Stanford in the game, rescheduled. Coming up this week. Yeah, they're better than we thought they would be. Yes. And Arizona was not as good as we thought they would yes, be. Yes, Cal could finish uh, with eight wins in the regular season. Yeah, they can legit beat Stanford. Their defense is top notch. How about the Wisconsin Badgers? This one hurts. <sighs> they lost the battle for Paul Bunyan's axe on Saturday, 37 15. This was the Badgers' first loss to Minnesota since 2003. 
Wisconsin finishes the regular season at 7-5. and five. I still think that was an awesome win for BYU, but I did say on the Thursday of that week, if BYU wins the game, then Wisconsin wasn't that good, and Wisconsin ended up 7-5. and five. Washington, they won the Apple Cup over Washington State 28-15 in a blizzard. Huskies win the North. They play Utah in the Pac-12 title game. Huskies all the way up to number 10 in the AP poll. That's the best team BYU's played by rank, and Utah 17th in the same poll. Utah State and Boise State played against each other. Yes, huge game. And the Broncos beat the Aggies 33-24 on the blue, clinching the Mountain West Conference Mountain Division title. The Aggies finished the regular season 10-2. The Broncos, also 10-2, will host Fresno State in the MWC title game this Saturday. Boise climbs two spots to number 19 in the AP poll while the Aggies fall out. They are exactly one out. I think they're the first team out after the loss. Yeah, exactly. Hawaii, the Rainbow Warriors finished the season 8-5 and five after getting a 31-30 OT win at San Diego State. That's a nice win. Cole McDonald threw for a career-high 452 in the game. Whoa. Northern Illinois finishes their regular season 7-5 and five after a 28-21 loss to Western Michigan. The Huskies had already clinched a spot in the MAC championship game on Friday. They'll take on Buffalo. New Mexico State, the Aggies finished the season with two straight losses after Liberty beat the Aggies 28-21 on Saturday. Mexico State 3 and 9. UMass was already done with the regular season. They went 4 and 8. McNeese finished 6 and 5. So, BYU played 8 teams that were bowl eligible uh-huh. and went 2 and 3 against the Gauntlet. 2 and th- sorry, 2 and 4 against the Gauntlet, 2 and 3 against Power 5 teams. Oh. Because we included Boise State in the Gauntlet. What's frustrating is BYU is 2 yards away from beating Boise State and if they can hold a 20 point lead against Utah, then they are 4 and two against the yes. gauntlet. And and then and then what is it? Eight and four regular season. We're all like, this is amazing. Yes, Joey with- Boy State, snap streak against Utah. Awesome. Not only that, all four yes. of those wins in the gauntlet. These are all moral victories. Right. Go ahead. Right, right, and, right. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, two no, yard line. No ah. question. Yeah, no question. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what, what's crazy is if BYU had beaten Boise and Utah, then they would have had four gauntlet wins on the road. Incredible. Arizona, but, Wisconsin, Boise State, Utah. Yes, and those were, listen, this was a tough season. You know I think these schedules are too tough, and look uh, what happens. You know, you play uh, eight bowl-eligible teams. You play, like, how many ranked teams has BYU played that, how many teams has BYU played that were ranked at some time? Yeah. Let's, let's look at it. Cal, Wisconsin, obviously, Utah, Utah State, Boise State, Washington. I mean, this is a tough schedule. It's a tough schedule. It makes you wonder How much was BYU conditioned this year with this schedule with their predominantly young offensive line and their freshman quarterback? That's why I'm saying just ease up a touch. Play three or four power fives. How much much difference will that make moving forward against these continually difficult schedules? September is crazy. And, uh, yeah, September is uh, Utah. It's Tennessee on the road. It's Washington and it's USC. So it doesn't get any easier. Oh, by the way, USC keeps their head coach, Clay Helton. How about that? Okay. Coming up, where will BYU go bowling? We've got the latest projections, some of which uh, aren't accurate. And has Corbin (laughs) Kafusi cemented his place as a BYU legend after what he did on Saturday night? Incredible. This is BYU Sports Nation. It's supposed to be a tease. I'll just tell you. Yes. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Perhaps you're doing it now, but if you can't watch or listen to BYU Sports Nation live at noon Eastern, fear not. Download the podcast on iTunes, TuneIn, or Google Play, Stitcher as well. Enjoy on demand. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation with our question of the day. What was the good, the bad, and the ugly in the BYU rivalry loss at BYU underscore game day answers on Twitter? The good. For the first time in a long time, Utah didn't feel like the better team. BYU matched them in talent and intensity. The bad. Injuries. Losing depth. We couldn't keep up. The ugly. Running the same plays unsuccessfully in the second half. Halfback draw. Jet sweep. 12-yard curl route. Yeah, Utah made some adjustments. uh, And and BYU had to adjust to those plus Nomad Hadley, which changed everything. It did. It really did. And think about it. BYU's playing... uh, a guy that was a linebacker like three weeks before, four weeks before. So it, it was just tough, the attrition. If Lopini Katoa plays in this game, I don't know if BYU wins, but I certainly feel good about the run game and BYU's ability it's to kind of ability move to the maintain, chains. To maintain yes. in the second half, right? Sure. So, so Lopini Katoa uh, got hurt at the end of the New Mexico State game, and unfortunately 
uh, he was hurt so bad he couldn't play in the Utah game. So then, obviously, Squally Canada was out as well. Squally hasn't been the same. Squally was good in the Arizona-Wisconsin game. He has been a non-factor outside of those, which was really disappointing. The senior kind of leader of those running backs. I had a couple of Utah fans show up in my timeline and say, you act like it's something that Utah doesn't understand to lose players to injury. Like, you're delusional. Sorry, are you down to your f- fifth string running back? No, and, you're on your back. And it happened in the second half of the game. It's, it's different going into a game knowing you're not going to have a guy yes. than losing the guy in the heat of battle. And your quarterback is a redshirt freshman, not a true freshman, FYI. Come on. And you didn't offer him a scully. Just Come on. Come on. We got him. <laughs> By the way, certain BYU players on the sideline motivating uh, Zach Wilson on Saturday saying, hey, you weren't good enough to play there, remember? You weren't good enough to play for Utah. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jack Tuttle. <laughs> Corbin Kafusi was awesome in this game. We've oh. talked about it, which brings us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Corbin Kafusi had seven tackles against Utah with two and now three Two season-ending injuries, plus I guess he broke his pinky or something. He has to have three separate surgeries. He has to have three separate surgeries to repair injuries, and each of the three could have kept him out for the rest of the season. But you can't repair the heart of a champion. dude. He was awesome, dude. An emotional interview for Corbin Kafusi after the game as part of our BYU TV Sports postgame. We're going to play the entirety of that right here. Uh, Soak it in. Corbin Kafusi. Entering legendary status for BYU football. Corbin, uh, what a game. I mean, a tale of two halves. And I know it meant so much to you to be on the field tonight, play hurt, to play hurt, to play injured. Just what are your thoughts after uh, another emotional BYU Utah game? You know, that's, that's what, these are the games you live for. And it came down to the wire like that, and you live for these moments. And, you know, I'm, it hurts, but at the same time, I'm just happy because I just love playing the game. And I know that my teammates are the same way. You know, we just love to play the game. Now, nobody would have questioned you for sitting on the sideline, knowing that you have to have surgery and you got to take care of your body and get ready for the NFL draft combine and whatnot. Why did you feel so strong that you needed to play and make a difference tonight? I think for me, it's, you know, twice this season I've had season-ending injuries, and, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't affect what I want to do. And so, you know, mid-season I had a season-ending injury, but you can come back from it. You know, there's still left, some left in the tank. And, you know, two weeks ago I had a season-ending injury, but at the same time I know there was just more to give, and I'm just happy to play with these guys. I saw Britton Covey sprint over to you specifically after the game ended. What was that conversation like? Uh, you know, Britty is one of – he's my little brother's best friend, and he's my best friend's little brother. And so I grew up with him. He's an amazing kid, and so – I just, you love the game so much, and to compete with someone or compete against someone that loves the game just as much as you, you know, there's a lot of respect for that, and so it was great to see him. I think everyone's trying to figure out where things kind of started to fall apart for BYU when things went so well for essentially three quarters. When, when did it start to fall apart for you guys? You know, I think there was just a couple assignment mistakes, and once those assignment mistakes happened, we kind of let that get on us a little bit, and we should have responded better, but, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. You have a bowl game to look forward to. I know that uh, you may not be playing in that, um, but what do you think about this BYU team? If, if this is the last time you suit up with your brothers, what are your thoughts on your teammates and, and this specific team? I, I love them. Like, there's no, nowhere else I'd rather be right now than with these guys. You know, I, I probably don't look super sad, and it's just because I got to play one last time with my brothers. You know, last week I wasn't able to play, and it was heartbreaking, and to come out and be able to just play one more game with them, that was everything to me. Corbin, I know that all of Cougar Nation is super grateful that you went out there and, and battled for the guys. Uh, tough loss, but congratulations, and uh, we wish you the best of luck moving forward. Yeah, thank you very much. Corbin Kafusi with three separate injuries. Each of them could have kept him out for the rest of the season, had to play one more game. A conversation with the doctor of, look, can my ankle get much worse or can my leg get much worse? No, but you need surgery. Well, then I'm playing. So figure it out. Tape it up. I'm playing. And BYU fed off that inspiration and fed off that fire for more than two quarters. Unfortunately, it didn't last. BYU needed a little more from more people, right? But what what a story. And I wish that he would have had a win over Utah. I wish that Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams and Daniel Sorensen and Bronson Kafut, that all of those guys would have had at least one win against Utah. And it just hurts that none of them do. 
But you can't stop the inspirational story that was Corbin Kafusi. Oh, Super cool. What an effort. Super cool. What an effort. Coming up, bold projections are in, but are they correct? And three former Cougars go for double figures with their respective professional teams. This is BYU Sports Nation. Love it. Shout out to today's guest, ESPN's Trevor Maddich and BYU football senior Corbin Kafusi. If you missed any of the show, download the podcast. Go to BYUSN.com to watch full episodes on demand. Sorry to Dennis Pitta. We ran out of time. Let's whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Football. BYU loses to Utah. 35-27. Uh, eighth straight loss. BYU led by 20 points twice. Corbin Kafusi made his final appearance uh, as a BYU Cougar. He's not going to play in the bowl game. Uh, season-ending injuries, totaling seven tackles. BYU 6-6 six six awaits a bowl invitation no later than this Sunday. Okay, new bowl projections have been released Let's after Saturday's loss against the Utes. And I will tell you if this is an ESPN-owned bowl or not. Okay, the Sporting News and Bill Bender place BYU against Missouri in the Independence Bowl. Not in ESPN, not one, but a uh, Power 5 opponent would be awesome. ESPN's Mitch Sherman projects BYU and Wake Forest in the Bad Boy Mowers Gasparilla Bowl in Tampa, Florida. That's one of the 13. We, we think that it's more than likely one of those 13. Kyle Bonagura, also with ESPN, projects BYU in the first responder bowl against Middle Tennessee. Yes, that's one of them. Both the Gasparilla Bowl and the first responder bowl, bowl by the way, are the day after Christmas, December 26th. Gasparilla is the 20th. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. NBC Sports has BYU in the same first responder bowl taking on nationally ranked army. I wouldn't mind that nine one. and two. Let's do it. And SI.com has BYU taking on old mountain West conference foe TCU in the cheese it bowl in Phoenix, Arizona on December 26th. A lot of power five projections there. I would love that. Let's do it. The, the one common bowl game I have seen for the last four weeks is the first responder bowl. Yeah, I'm yeah, hearing that a lot. So I'm starting to think it's going to be Dallas, at least, Texas. At least it's not the famous Idaho potato. But who's the who's the <laughs> opponent? Our army in the first responder bowl would be be compelling. Would be absolutely. Yeah, BYU's never played army. Has never in, played army. In independence, Period. right? Ever? No, I don't think they've wow. ever played. I knew they hadn't played them in independence. I'm pretty sure they've never played. Wow. No. Yeah, okay. All right. So there you go. Those are your bowl projections as of November 26th. Men's basketball. BYU lost 76-62 at home to Houston on Saturday. Uh, 76-62. TJ Haas, a season high 25, made six threes. The only child, 16 points. Cougars play at Illinois State. Wednesday, 8 Eastern. The new net rankings came out from the NCAA BYU 94th. How's Illinois State? I need to look at that. Not good. BYU women's volleyball received the number four overall seed in the NCAA tournament. That is the equivalent of a one seed for the NCAA men's basketball tournament. The ladies will host America East champion Stony Brook on Friday. With a win, BYU would then take on the winner of Utah and Denver. Mm. Women's basketball. Cougars have won four straight after beating TCU Friday, 68, uh, 61-58. Cal Baptist 76-69 on Saturday. BYU plays at Southern Utah tomorrow night. Cougars in the NFL. Fred Warner had seven tackles in a 49ers loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Warner's now 17th overall in total tackles for the NFL and fourth among rookies. Kyle Van Noy had five tackles and a tackle for loss for the Patriots in a win over the Jets. Michael Davis continues to play well for the Los Angeles Chargers of San Diego. He had five tackles in a 45-10 <laughs> win against the Arizona Cardinals. They should call themselves that. <laughs> Jamal Williams had a single carry for five yards in a Green Bay loss against the Vikings. Cougars overseas. Tyler Haas is balling right now for Huesca in Spain. He scored 22 points. He's becoming one of the guys for that team. Pulled down eight rebounds. One of the only assists in an 89-82 win. Elijah Bryant, 18 points, 11 rebounds, and a block in a 77-71 win for Hapayo Elliott in Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, in Israel. In <laughs> He suddenly moved to Wisconsin. Might as well be Wisconsin. <laughs> that remote. Brandon Davies recorded 11 points with an assist and a rebound in a 109-68 Zalgiris victory in Lithuania. And because Kyle Collinsworth plays for the G League Raptors team, we bunch him into the Cougars overseas, even though it isn't overseas. It's Canada. just over rivers. Kyle Collinsworth, 8 points, 5 assists, 7 rebounds, 3 steals, and a win for the G League Raptors. Yeah, it's over the narrow neck of land of the Great Lakes. <laughs> Lake Michigan. <laughs>
<laughs> Today's rise and shout goes to Corbin. Corbin Kafusi. Absolutely. Amazing. We already said one. Yeah. Question of the day. What was the good, the bad, and the ugly in the BYU rivalry loss? Elite voice of the day. From Storm and Warman 1 on Instagram, presented by Sundance Mountain Resort, celebrating 50 years. The good, the first half. The bad, the second half. The ugly, the fourth quarter. And a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> <sighs> the conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. For Jerem, I am Spencer. Shout out to all of the Kafusis. Go Cougs. That's a lot of them.